Great, good morning. Um, as was announced, this is an open ministry meeting, and so um, I just had a few thoughts, and um, I'd like to read a few verses in Exodus chapter 21. Um, and so if you, I don't have a PowerPoint or anything today, but um, I can certainly read these verses, and I know Keith's looking for that. But I'm going to go ahead and read just the first six verses of Exodus chapter 21. Now these are the rules that you shall set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall, shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to, the, shall bring him to God and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. So what I wanted to talk about for just a few minutes this morning is to try to make a practical application for our Christian walk, for our Christian life, from this well-known story in the Old Testament. And just before I make a little bit of application, you get the idea of the story, this, this slave that would go and serve the master for six years. And let's say that during that time that the master had another servant, another slave, another person working in that home that was a woman, and they became, they got married, they had a couple of kids in that span of six years. And here he is at the end of the sixth year, and he has a decision to make. He can either be free for the rest of his life, but if he does that, he has to leave behind his wife and his couple of children, or he can decide that I love my wife, I love my master, I love my children, I will not go out free, and if that was the case, then there was something that would mark that man for the rest of his life, because they would go to the doorpost, and he would take that all, that, that um, oversized um, um, ice pick that um, you may have seen uh, as an old tool, um, that I think is often now used for people that work with leather to try to make a hole through the leather that they're working with. And that would be driven through the ear of that man and pierce his ear, and that mark would be upon him for the rest of his life. And what I want you, us to consider for just a couple of minutes is that we have something on the inside, the Lord Jesus, that should mark us on the outside. And so this slave, this man, he had something on the inside. He had love for his wife and his children and his master. And then something marked him on the outside. And in between meetings, I ran over to Dollar General to buy some, uh, some Coke Zero because I need some caffeine. And um, I noticed that um, there were two different people that were walking around and they had the big gauges in their ears. And you've seen that. And I've never seen a person with, that has gauges without the gauges in their ear, okay? But I think about the, the size of the hole in the ear that this all would have made in this man's ear. And it probably, at least to people that weren't the wife and the children, would have been kind of gross to look at and, and would, would want to turn away. But my point is, is that to the wife and to the children, when they would see that, that pierced ear, that they would remember that day when that father made that decision and it would be lovely to them. And of course, my thoughts go to the marks of Calvary on the Lord Jesus Christ, that when we get to see them someday, we'll know that those wounds were for us. But to think about the change on the inside that is um, reflected by something on the outside. And uh, within the past couple of months, um, the uh, Century 3 Mall in West Mifflin um, closed. And so some of you may have been there. At one point, it was the second largest mall in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, the King of Prussia Mall is huge. I've never been there. I know it's really big. But in the 80s, the Century 3 Mall was the second biggest mall in Pennsylvania. And so over time, it's kind of an economically distressed area, has, has fallen into disrepair. And then finally, um, a few weeks back, a month or so ago, 
the building inspector from uh, the borough of West Mifflin had to post some signs up there because the roof was leaking and there were some other problems and it just wasn't safe. And so I think there were only about 12 stores in there left and so they all had to leave and they all had to shut it down. And when that news happened, or one of my daughters saw it on Twitter, I think it might have been Caitlin that said something about end of an era. And um, she said that because the school, um, of course, that I used to work at was just down the road from Century 3 Mall, Caitlin said, you know, anytime there was a birthday for a classmate, we'd be at Claire's, okay? So if you are a dad and you've ever been in Claire's, okay? I know, exactly. So um, there's everything that a girl or maybe a boy could want to find something that's inexpensive that could be given as a birthday gift. All I remember is while I'm in Claire's with my daughters that there's a lot to choose from. So when there's a lot to choose from, you're in there for a while and so you're wandering around and you're trying to kill time. And I always remember that, of course, in Claire's, there would be this chair, this kind of high chair that someone would be sitting in from time to time of various age levels and some mostly most of the time it was a girl every once in a while it was a boy and they're getting their ear pierced their ears pierced and they never looked very comfortable they never looked like it was a you know a fun thing to do but they did it and then it was over and you know they um, got their ears pierced but I think about this um, this man and not just the fact that this would have hurt but the fact that um, it would have been something that wasn't like this nice little hole that it would have been something large that you would have been able to see for probably the rest of the rest of his life. And so if we each think back to the day that we got saved, however old you were the day that you got saved, we were so excited, we wanted to tell everybody, and if you're anything like me, for that first year or several months, it's like I just wanted to do everything for the Lord. I wanted to read my Bible. I wanted to be it um, meeting as often as possible and just all of those things. And then I think over time that, you know, we become a little more lukewarm and then it kind of comes and goes and, and we really try to have that close relationship with the Lord Jesus. But I just want to apply two things and then I'll sit down. And that is, again, if we have this change on the inside, salvation, then what, how is that marked? What, how are we marked on the outside? And the two things that I just want to touch on briefly are displaying patience with other people, other human beings. And the second thing is when we face something that is um, a huge challenge or very uh, challenging, whether it's a, a problem at work or a financial um, situation or um, a relationship, um, maybe with a coworker or with someone in your extended family, whatever it might be. So. Um, and it kind of caught my attention recently, it might have been just last Sunday when Matt was talking and, and he was talking about like trying to keep things in perspective and sometimes he pauses and asks himself, well, why am I getting so upset about this driver that wanted to pull in there? Or, you know, for me, sometimes I have to just remember that there will be lines at Walmart, right? There will be uh, sometimes uh, cashiers at different places that don't move as quickly as you would like them to because, um, you know, it's not like they know my schedule and it's and, and they're, they're doing their job. And um, so my point is, is that if, if there's a change on the inside, we're saved, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, um, we're on our way to heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ is living in us in the, the temple of the Holy Spirit is our body, the Holy Spirit is in us, then if I look at it from that perspective, then the change that's on the inside, just like that servant, what marks me on the outside? Is it impatience? Is it sarcasm? Is it, fr is it um, frustration? Is it rolling my eyes? Is it grumbling under my breath? Is it grabbing my bags and you know walking away when the, the, uh, the um, transaction is finally complete? Or is every interaction with another person an opportunity? You know, Keith just preached the gospel and talked about the most important thing that will ever be um, go, that will ever go into the ears of everyone in this room, the kids that went downstairs, people that are watching online, is the good news of the gospel of salvation. The most important words that will ever go into anyone's ears. And so I'm not saying that we need to, you know, um, have a, an ongoing banter with the person that's um, the cashier 
and, and have a short gospel message and some personal one-on-one -on -one evangelism, but maybe the place to start is for us to just zoom out and, and sort of um, try to be aware of what I'm saying, what I'm doing, what message, what vibe am I giving off, and that's certainly even more true at work or um, in different places with extended family, people that know me, people that I'm around more often, what is the behavior that marks me from I have something inside that's unbelievably amazing, but is it being reflected on the outside when I deal with other people? And I think as a culture, and I know this is true for me, that I'm probably less patient now than I was five years ago or ten years ago. And there's probably a lot of different reasons for that, but if that's true, then that doesn't mean that I should be any less patient with other people. Um, if anything, or if, no, if nothing else, it's an opportunity for people to see that there's something different about us. And then the second thing, and then this is my last point, is to just consider when we come against difficulties. And I don't necessarily mean trials as far as like a family member that passes away or something like that, but like a, a problem at work or um, something that's difficult with um, finances, an unexpected big expense, or just um, a, a, something um, that's a relationship issue um, about whether it be with our spouse or whether it would be with a coworker or our boss or whatever it might be, is again, how am I acting in those situations when I come up against something? Am I getting anxious? Am I getting angry? Am I getting upset? It's sort of like sometimes I feel like I really like to think about the feeding of the 4,000, okay? Because the feeding of the 5,000 had just happened shortly before that, and the, they watched, the disciples watched this miracle happen. And then a few days, or at most a few weeks later, there's 4,000 people there, and they look to the Lord, and they're like, what are we going to do? And the Lord must have just stood there for a second, and you think about it, that the, the feeding of the 4,000 sometimes I apply, try and apply that to myself, is, is that when I come up against that um, challenge at work or relationship challenge or whatever the case might be, if we, again, zoom out and think about how many times in our life has, the, has God provided just the right thing at just the right time without us even praying or asking for it, and that's not to say that we shouldn't use common sense or research how to solve the problem or apply best practice when it comes to things at work or um, put a lot of effort into that relationship. We should still do all of those things. But I think that our temperament, our interactions, our, our body language, our tone of voice, all of those things send a message. And um, personally, this um, has given, this, this little passage has given me the opportunity to stop and kind of take stock and evaluate, um, am, am I displaying patience toward other people? And am I displaying confidence and reliance upon God when I run into um, challenging situations? And so really just to review and to just conclude is to remember that just like that servant in Exodus chapter 21, there was something on the inside, love for his wife and his children that made him do something that marked him on the outside. And so as Christians, we have something on the inside, eternal life, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. And then for all of us, we just need to ask ourselves that question, what are the things that mark me as a Christian on the outside? What is the evidence, the outward evidence of the inward change of the fact that I am a Christian and have the Lord Jesus Christ living inside of me? May God bless his word.
was uh, <clears throat> just doing my daily reading, and um, I try to read something in the Old Testament. Well, I do. I read it in the Old Testament, then something in the New Testament every day to try to um, balance the two out a little bit. And I was just reading in Matthew. It's always good to go back and listen to the words that the Lord himself spoke. And so I was reading in Matthew and uh, chapter 19, and the story of the young rich ruler came up, right, Um, uh, in Matthew uh, chapter 19. And we all know the story, right? Everybody knows the story about this guy. Um, I personally think he was a pretty good guy. He came and uh, he had everything in life. I'm sure that he had all the clothes you could want. I'm sure that he had a nice chariot and uh, a lot of money, probably some position within the community. I think he was a good guy. I I don't think he was a bad guy at all. Uh, But anyway, he comes to the Lord and he says, uh, uh, good master or good teacher, whatever he, he said, what must I do to have eternal life? And the Lord says, you know, uh, uh, follow the commandments. First he says, why do you call me good? And he says, you've got to follow the commandments. He says, which one? And the Lord picks off a couple of pretty big ones. Don't murder anybody. Uh, this, that, and the other thing. And love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, you're talking about me. That's me. I have done all those things. Man, I'm set. So he had everything on earth, but he was still a little bit worried about eternal life, but he thought he was pretty good. And so uh, the Lord kind of tells him all that sort of thing. And <clears throat> just like what Mark was just saying, I, I often wonder what went through the Lord's mind. Uh, I think he must have had a pretty good sense of humor, and he must have had a ton of patience because people pop off and tell him these types of things. And he goes, okay. Well, uh, how about you sell everything you have? How, how about we start with there? Sell everything you have. Give it all to the poor and come and follow me. That's an easy thing, isn't it? How much do you really want to know that you have eternal life? And so, man, that, that kind of wrecked his world. And the guys probably shook his head a little bit and said, wow, I didn't expect that, nor am I going to do that. <laughs> and so he puts his head down and he walks away all bummed out and everything like that. <clears throat> and then the Lord tells the story. Uh, starting in verse 23, he said, And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? You're narrowing it down here. Who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but with God all things are are possible. So the Lord tells him that. Uh, the disciples reply back to him. And then he says, You guys are thinking about this all wrong. With God anything's possible. With man it's impossible. You can't save yourself. Keith was just telling us about that. You're not going to save yourself. It's just impossible. But with God, everything's possible. That's the way you've got to think about it. And then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? What am I going to get out of this? You know? And so, just like we've been hearing, these apostles followed the Lord uh, throughout his life. And, uh, but yet, there's questions. And there is issues that they try to figure out with Jesus Christ right in front of them, you know. And I oftentimes think, man, if I was, man, if I was walking around with the Lord, certainly, uh, I would have a lot more insight into things than I have today, or I would have been spiritually uplifted beyond what I am today. But Peter hears uh, the Lord's reply to the rich man to give up everything, uh, give up everything and to follow him. And the rich man had a whole lot of stuff to give up, didn't he? He had 
money and he had clothes and he had everything you could want in this world. He was covered. And the rich man had probably a mansion and power position. Um, but he still wanted to be safe for all eternity. But he was not willing to give up everything to make sure that he was safe for eternity. Um, and Peter says, hey, I did give up everything. I did give up everything. And, and uh, so what, what, do I, what am I going to get? I'm a little bit nervous here. I'm not quite sure what's going on. This guy was a pretty good guy. He went walking away. And so when I thought about it, I'm thinking to myself, um, what did Peter really have? Right? This guy had beautiful robes to wear. Peter, he probably had torn rags. <laughs> but he gave up everything. Don't forget. He gave up everything. Um, this guy had wealth, money, Power. Peter had poverty. He really didn't have much of anything. This guy lived in a palace. Peter lived as a pauper. He didn't have much of a house, I'm sure. And the Lord, uh, the Lord gave Peter everything, and yet he was questioning and saying, "I gave up everything. I gave up everything. And what about me? What then will we have?" He gave up some nets, probably an old boat. He probably gave up not much of a house. So he did give up what he had, but he didn't have anything compared to what the rich man had. But when it really comes down to it, what did the Lord want? What was he saying? Did he want that guy's riches? No. No. He didn't care about how rich the guy was. Doesn't care about how rich any of us are. What about how poor Peter was? He didn't care about how poor Peter was. Things, the Lord's speaking in terms of spirituality and up at this level of existence while we, Peter, Everybody, we get dragged down into the things around us. So what did the Lord really want? What did he want? And when I was reading through this, uh, I was thinking about the Old Testament, and I was thinking about Samuel, 1 Samuel, when um, the Lord tells Saul. Saul was the anointed king. Saul was given a position on this earth to lead God's people. It was a position of authority and it was a good position of great responsibility and so Saul had this position and the Lord told him that he should go down to um, Amalek they were no good to the Jewish people they were bad with the people from Israel he said go down and wipe them out I've had it with these guys Saul you go down and wipe them out it's yours to take don't even worry about it you'll be fine and in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, in verse 7, it says, Then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the Amalekite king, but completely destroyed everyone else. So God told him, you go down, you wipe them all out. I don't want any of this sinful nation left on the world. So he killed everybody but Agag. Saul and his men spared Agag's life and kept the best of the sheep and goats and cattle and fatty calves and the lambs, everything, in fact, that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. So, what did the Lord Jesus want from the rich? What did he want from Peter? What did he want from me? What did he want? What does he want from you? What did he want? So the Lord was very displeased with Saul, and he sent down Samuel to talk to Saul. And Saul says, uh, "I have some bad news for you." Samuel says, "I have some bad news for you, Saul." And Saul's like, "What? What, what did I do?" 
I didn't do anything wrong. He says, well, what are all those goats I hear? You know, I hear all these animals, goats and stuff. Well, where, where did you get all those? And so they're talking back and forth. And then in verse 17, it says, And Samuel told him, Although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribe of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, Go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for plunder and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? So he calls him on, and Saul's like, he gets all defensive. He knew he did wrong. He knew it. He knew that he wasn't trying to please the Lord. He knew that he wasn't giving the Lord what the Lord asked for. And he came back and said, but I did obey the Lord. I did obey the Lord. Saul insisted. it. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agag but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops bought, brought in the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. How many times in our life that we are faced with a decision? This or that? And as a Christian... You want to go straight down the middle. You want to be on the straight and narrow all the time. And you face two decisions, just like Saul did. The Lord told me what to do. I did that. I did what the Lord told me what to do. But he really didn't. So many times you face decisions in your life which there is just this slight gray area in the middle, where you could go that way or the hard right to where you're supposed to go, and you dabble with the gray area. And I hope I'm speaking to myself. But is this really the right thing to do, or is it close enough that God won't be upset? With it? I think it's the right thing to do. I think it's still good. I think I'm still good. Saul so said, I did. I did obey God. I did what he told me. I went and wiped out everybody. I kept the good stuff to give back to him, you see. I did better than good. I did wonderful. Justifying it in his own mind before Samuel, which didn't mean anything. And then Samuel comes back with a big needle. And Saul's standing there with his big puffed up balloon all filled with how much he did do and Samuel comes with the needle and says what is more pleasing to the Lord your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice listen obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rain What did the Lord want from the rich ruler? What did he want from Peter? And what does he want from you and I? He wanted something, God wanted something that Saul couldn't give him. Saul could never get enough of his own pride. Saul could never get enough that the world had to offer. He was given everything. He was given the king, kingship. He was given direct instructions from God. God told him exactly what had to be done. Man, if there were 10 things in my life that I faced and God said, there it is, go do it, it would have made life easy and I, would, I could have just went and did it rather than messing around in the, in the middle of the road there. But he was told what to do but at the end of the day, what he could never do and what we must do is Saul was not a man after God's heart. Every day of his life, he just wasn't. He was chosen by God. He was selected by God. He was spoke to by God. 
But he was not the man. He would follow his own heart rather than God's heart. Then go after God's heart. And God wants men, women after his heart. Every second of the day, every day of the year, that's what he wants. And so we read further in uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 13. Um, but now your kingdom, he's speaking about Saul, shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, which is David, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And then down in Acts chapter 13 and verse 22, it says, And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testi testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. As a Christian, when you're saved, some of us struggle with it a little bit more than others. Some hold back. Some go for it with all guns like Mark was talking about when he first got saved. I want to read my Bible 24 hours a day. I want to go to every meeting. I'm going to pray until I'm done praying. Then I'm going to start praying again. I am going to be a good Christian no matter what it takes. The Lord really wants your heart and built into your Christian DNA, built into your inner workings, is something that these people didn't have. We have the Holy Spirit. Do you want to serve the Lord? How many times in a day or a week or something you say, man, I missed an opportunity for the Lord. Do you want to serve Him? Do you want to feel like your spiritual life, your real life on earth is meaningful? Mark was talking about the, um, the, um, the things that are inside that come outward so that you, you know, sometimes I wonder if I was in a Christian court of law, could they convict me of being a Christian? They <laughs> just say, let this one go. You, know? you want to be able to be convicted of being a Christian. And so Peter had given the Lord what he wanted. He had given him his life. He had given him his heart. He had given it to him. He was fallen. But he was a very impulsive person, wasn't he? And I like that about Peter because it uh, shines a little light on our lives, you know. We're not in this thing alone. Being a little reckless and uh, I, I can't stand when these thoughts come into your mind and it's kind of contrary to what it should be. And you say, man, why am I thinking about that? You know, but his human instincts uh, kicked in. And uh, it's hard to imagine, but here was a man that saw people that didn't walk for 38 years get up and carry their bed away. He saw the Lord feed 5,000, then doubted him, and he saw the Lord feed 4,000. He saw blind men cry out, Son of David, have mercy on me, and he would rub some dirt in their eyes or spit on something and rub it in their eyes and tell them to go. And they would see again. Peter saw all these things. Peter saw the Lord stand up in a boat that was going to be capsized and say, waters be still, wind, stop, stop right now. Peter saw all that. He saw every bit of that. He heard the voice of the Lord. He saw the Lord transfigured. He saw, heard the voice of, a, of the Lord speak things that no one had ever heard spoken before. And he said, what then will we have? Asking the Lord, what's, in a, what's going to happen to me? How often does that ever happen to you? That you look back and inventory your life and see all the times that the Lord, and it kind of scares me when it happens, but God steps into your life and you know he's in there and you know that he's maneuvering things around and then they work out and you say, oh, you know, I'm not deserving of this. And then the next problem comes, you say, what about me? You know, what will I have here, Lord? What's going to happen here? But Peter did give him his heart. 
He witnessed Christ conquer every element of the earth. Physically, spiritually, demons get out, go into those pigs, <coughs> get lost. All the pigs jump off the hillside. He saw the Lord take a man wrapped in chains that was nuts. And when they came back, he was sitting by the Lord with his head on his chest. You know, so Peter had saw everything. But it, it is not strange for us as Christians to be able to soar to the heights of glory with the Lord one day. To be meditating or reading or doing something like that. And be just like, oh, I'm so fortunate to be a Christian. That the Lord is my redeemer. And then fall on some fear or hardships and be wallowing in fear and trembling at what's next in line for me. What then will we have? But never, never forget the Lord's response to Peter. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28, it says, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you will have followed me will also sit twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Peter, when I'm on my throne, this is all going to work out. When I'm on my throne, guess what? You guys are each going to have a throne and you're going to be judging the tribes of Israel. How do you like that? That rich young ruler had nothing. What will you have? You will be part of my royal kingdom. And then he says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or land for my sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and last first. I'm not saying you had to leave your mother or your father or your sister or your brother. But the point is, the Lord is telling you that anyone who has been blessed with salvation and knows deep in their heart that if they rank everything in their life that is important to them, Christ has to be on top. Do we devote the time he deserves? Rarely. Do we walk the path that he walked? Maybe not so often. But if you were to say, what are my greatest blessings in life? The natural thing is to look around at your family or whatever. But the truth of the matter is, it is looking to Christ. And that's what he's saying. And he says, but the first will be last and last will be first. He's saying that people, that people will be the same. Don't think because you're here, like when they were on a Mount of Transfiguration, they wanted to do something. Or how many times did people come up to the Lord and say, hey, when you're in your kingdom, can my son be on your right and my son be on your left? Blah, blah, blah. You'll, be, you'll be surprised. The Lord saying, you'll be surprised when you get up there who's first and who's last. So whether you're an outward evangelist or a quiet little church mouse, your service to the Lord is counted and logged in in heaven. And... Uh, Um, what, what that verse is telling me is that those who seem to have everything in life, like the rich man, they seem to have everything in life, they may really have nothing. And those who uh, don't seem to have all that much in life, they indeed have everything. 
So you could be the poorest Christian on earth and have more wealth and more uh, future to you than anybody else on earth. And I would just like each and every one in here this morning to consider who you are uh, and that you do have everything. Just like Peter had everything, my mom, she has everything. Paul has everything. Keith, you have everything. Danielle, everything. You got all those beautiful birds, but you have everything. You got everything. And in Revelations, the Lord was uh, evaluating the seven churches, and he came to Laodicea, and at the end of them, he tells them, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on the throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on the throne. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine that? Peter forgot it for a minute there. We are the Lord's bride. We will be with him for all eternity. We will be with him. On the throne, we'll be there. Like he said, I'm not quite sure what we'll be doing. But I know that God is a God of order, and he will have plenty for us to do. And in Colossians 3, we were reading it this week. Since you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears... When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What will I have? What will we have? We already have it. Whether we choose to live like we have it or not, we already have it. We're already victorious. We have already conquered. We have, have our place set in heaven. And, and just being in heaven... And abiding with the Lord for all eternity would be more than we could even understand. But to consider the fact that we have inherited what the Lord has and that we will be with the Lord when he's on the throne, it's more than any of us could even imagine or deserve, but yet we have it. So, when things get into your mind or into your life that have you a little bit confused, don't look down. Don't hang your head. Don't look left and don't look right. Look up. Think on things above. Think on the things that you have coming and the things that we are facing today in life. We'll all be gone someday, and it could be sooner than later. I mean, we could be sitting there pretty pretty quick, to be quite honest. Uh, so with that, um, I would just encourage everyone to um, always look up to the things that the Lord uh, has given to us and to appreciate all that we have. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you and we thank you for the twofold message that was given today. And we pray that we could serve you by understanding uh, the answer to the question, uh, so what, what do we have? And the answer is simple. We have everything. We are saved. We are secure. We are victorious in the Lord. It's nothing that we have done, which is... The wonderful part of it, it's where we are headed. And so, Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord, and we thank you for the many blessings you give to us and the comfort and care you take with us. And, Father, we would just thank you also for the food we're going to have and ask you to uh, bless your word to each and every one in the Lord's holy and precious name. Amen.